So good that you guys are with us this morning. And um, I just want to say right up front, right now, Darren, I'm sorry. I don't really know which direction I'm going to go right now. I was so prepared, and he's got my slides, and it's even in a PDF, so it wouldn't change the font and all of that organized. But right now, we're going to just talk. And so I'm going to pray for me, and I'm going to pray for you right now. And so, Jesus, I just thank you that, Father, we can prepare, and we can study, and we can come to church, and we can pitch up. But, God, we want you to speak to us. God, we want you to make things clear for us, God. And even as we sing that song, God, you've poured it out. We can see it. But, Father, I pray that if there's any one of us sitting going, I want it. How do I get it, Father God? Today you will show us. God, we speak about you're not a God who sits with a crystal ball and hands out uh, um, fortune cookies. But, Father, you do have a spirit that leads and guides and and shows us truths and, 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 and speaks into our situation. And so, Father God, I thank you that today right now, that we would be sensitive to your spirit. You are here right now, and you want to speak to us right now. And so, God, I pray that that whatever has been prepared, Father, only your words would be spoken today in Jesus' name. Amen. So if I were to say the words, fundamental attribution error, would anyone in this room know what that means? Fantastic. I love it when I know something and I didn't look at Joel. You know that. All right. So I was reading this book, and it's called The Advantage. I'm reading like seven books at the moment, so they might take longer to get through because there's seven of them, and I'm listening to a few as well because, you know, multitask. And have you ever had a book, or who does this, that picks up a book, reads it cover to cover before they pick up another one? Any people in those rooms? Like you don't start another one until you finish that one. Do you start multiple books? Who's a cover to cover, don't interrupt me, is it? That's so disciplined, very disciplined. Who in the room goes, this is a great book. Oh, hang on, this is a great book. Or somebody told me about another book. I better get that one too. And then you've got a loft full of books that make, is that you, Doug? Not you? And you've got a loft full of books and you're like, all these great ideas of, if you could just read all those books, you would be so clever and you would change the world, basically, in a nutshell. So here I am picking up all these books because I'm going to change the world. One day, when I've gone through all my books. But do you know that they release books too quickly, really? So, fundamental attribution error. And let me give you a breakdown of what it is. Oh, yes. So, it's in this book called The Advantage, and it's a leadership book. And uh, if anyone is in a position of, actually, you're all leaders. You are leading by example in whatever you do. It's an organizational health book, but it can go across anything. So if you're working for somebody, you can contribute to the team. If you are managing an area, you can set it up in a certain way that it would function really well. It's called The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. And so here it is. Fundamental attribution error is the tendency of human beings to attribute the negative or frustrating behaviors of someone else to their intentions or personalities. It's our human nature to contribute If you're irritating me, it's because of your personality or something that you've done, right? While attributing our own negative or frustrating behaviors to environmental factors. Isn't that so true? Let me give you an example. You're walking in the shop and there's a mom or a dad and their kids and the kids have lost it. Have you ever been in a shop and you can hear that there's a kid having a tantrum in an aisle and you just do not want to go there? Or sometimes you feel like you need to go there because you're not too sure if the kid's actually being murdered. Have you ever been in a shop with that? And so in our natural thing, we go, sheesh. That, and the dad's screaming, or if you've seen a mom take a kid and literally rip them up and walk out and leave their trolley. Have you seen that? Sometimes you feel like that. Don't go shopping with your kids. I'll give you a solution. Just don't. Or don't take them out at 10 o'clock shopping at night. It's just hard. Julia's come home. She says, I was so cross. This is a mom shopping with the kids at 10 o'clock and the kids were absolutely in pieces. So easy to sort of look at those situations and sort of go, these are the problems. That dad really has an, an attitude, like an anger issue. Shaking his fingers and blowing up and yanking the kid that the sockets all came out. And, and, and so we can attribute it to something they've done. Like they should never have been there. And they, you know, they should go for counseling, really, because you can't get that cross. And you can't relate to a kid like that anyway. And so we can pass these judgments because you can see the problem, right? But if it was you and your kid in the, the grocery store 
And if anyone were to look at you and pass the same judgments, it would not be the same. Yours is because you've had a tough day at work and your kid is just unruly. Nothing to do with you, an external factor. And so that's what fundamental attribution error is. We tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but we don't actually let somebody else off the hook. Have you ever experienced that in your life? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. There's certain people in the front row that are in the front row for a reason, because they've never experienced that. But the thing is, I've been thinking about this, is how easy it is, even when we sit in church, and even when we have conversations, and even when we say we've got to do this, somewhere along the line, it's easier to think, well, so-and-so needs to. And this person has to. You know, it's the, it's the general, everyone knows that you sit next to somebody in church and you get the nudge or you get the, like, no, some people are very subtle. They just nudge or sort of kick. Or you've been in a conversation, somebody kicks you under the table and they go, why are you kicking me? And you're like, really subtle. Have you ever done that? Husbands and wives do that. But it's, it's this whole thing of we treat other people differently to the way we want to be treated. And so where am I going with all of these things? Is that, let me take us, let's go back to the word. It's going to tie up, I promise. We're speaking about, have you heard? Have you heard what God can do? Have you heard and have you perceived what God wants to do in this church, that he wants to do in your lives, in your family, in your business? Have you heard it? Have you understood? Last week we spoke about how these people rushed towards God because they heard and they went and did something. But I was thinking about it in the, in the past few weeks and, and days, is that sometimes we can hear it, we can know it, but we haven't seen it. And so I was taken to, reminded about the scripture in Matthew 5 where it says, Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. And in my heart I'm thinking, that's the answer. Right there, God, how are we going to see what you have for us? Because it speaks about perceiving. Have you heard? Can you understand? Can you, perceive? Can you see it for yourself? And so I was going, God, well, what is it going to take for us to see it for ourselves? And that's why fundamental attribution error is we're going to have to take responsibility for ourselves. We can't sit and go, well, for me it's different. For me it's not going to affect me the same way as somebody else. And so an example today that I, you know, that I want to talk about, which I've never thought of, but I was thinking about it in, this, in this, the way, the way you know, God takes you through the Bible. Because I was starting with, I'll show you my mind map so that you can, no one gets lost. Talking about creating me, a, I mean, the pure in heart will see God. Then there's another scripture saying, God created me a pure heart. Who was it that prayed that prayer? Renew a steadfast spirit unto me and the joy and, and renew the, stead, um, the joy of my salvation was David. King David, who was one of God's mighty men, who has gone down in history and will forever go down in history as a man after God's own heart. So the next minute I found myself looking at David's life going, okay, he, he was an example of, you know, here we are. If we're going to take responsibility for ourselves, going, God, I can't treat others the way I'm not willing to be treated myself. So he gets to a place. Let me give you a background. King David, he gets, he, he gets anointed when he was a kid. Out in the field, the, dad, the, the prophet comes and says, there's a king. God has told me there's a king. He's raised up. Bring me all your sons. And the dad lines all his sons up, and the prophet's going, it's not him, not him, not him. Are you sure these are all your kids? And he goes, oh, there's a little one tending the sheep. Comes and calls him. His dad didn't even think about him. So he comes up, and he goes, this is the one. You're anointed. A kid, very young. Next minute, it's time for him to start serving under his king called Saul, who actually went completely doolally. He lost it. He was possessed by evil spirits, and he tried to kill him. So he was his harp player, and he would speak to him and minister to him. And the next minute, the person that you're serving, the boss that you're working for, is not only just trying out to get you, he's trying to kill you. And so he has to serve under that. And, and then this is the same David that goes and takes out Goliath, with a stone and a slingshot. This is the David we're talking about. Here we find ourselves in 2 Samuel, where it says he was at home and he was walking around the, ba the balcony of his home while everyone else was at war, and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. And he thinks, she is stunning. Somebody go and get me that girl. So she, she comes, you know, this is just because he's in power, he can, whatever. She comes in, he sleeps with her, she falls pregnant. While her husband, who is one of his top commanders, is out in the front lines fighting a battle. Are you with me? Then he finds out this woman is pregnant. What does he do? He calls for Uriah to come in because now he has to fix his problem. His problem that was done in secret. How many of you know your thoughts, your heart emotions, your intentions, the things done in secret, 
have a way that I, oh, it's outside, um, have a way of making itself known. The affair was secret, but the pregnancy was very public. And so we think we can hide things in our hearts and we can just deal with them or actually push them so far away because actually, you know, it's not a big deal. But somehow they make themselves visible and expose ourselves to the world and ourselves to ourselves. And so here she is pregnant. Now he can't hide that. So his big plan is to get Uriah back and say to him, you just come. Come for two nights. You've been working really hard. Just go home and see your wife. Because he thinks if he could just go and be with his wife, then you know they'll never tie the two together. And so his whole plan is that he would fix it. And so Uriah comes in and he's an honorable man. He's a man that has got his whole troops with him. And he goes, thank you, but I'm my men are fighting in the, in the front lines. I cannot. And he sleeps at the door of the palace with all the other servants. And so David's like, this isn't working. Are you mad? I've asked you to go to your wife. So he starts panicking. He goes, okay, okay. He goes, okay, why don't you spend just two more days here and then you can go back to be with your, your troops. And so what he does is he has a dinner and he tries to get him drunk. And then he tries to send him back to his wife again. And what happens is, he doesn't go there. He sleeps outside in the courtyard with the servants. So there, that plan doesn't work. So the next thing he does is he sends word to the person in charge going, Uriah is coming back. Put him in the front line. Charge. And when you're charging, pull back so that he will be in the hardest part of the war. This is a man after God's own heart. And this is his plan to fix his own mistake. And so here we, you know, here we are with David, and this is what he's doing, and, and we sort of sit and think, what? This is God's king. This is a king after God's heart, and he's, he's known as, as King David, who writes the most beautiful psalms in the Bible, but he finds himself writing this thing going, God, create in me a pure heart. Create in me a pure heart. How did he get to that point? Nathan the prophet finds out, and he comes to him, and he says, tells him a story. And he says to him, now remember the attribution error, right? So he tells him a story. Because when somebody tells you a story, sometimes it's easier to sort of receive it than when you have to deal with it up front. And he says to him, there are two men in the same city, one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had huge flocks of sheep, herds and cattle. And the poor man had nothing but one female little lamb, which he had brought and raised. It grew up with him and his children and a fa a member, as a member of the family. It ate off their plates and drank from their cups. Some of you have got dogs that do this in your home. My parents had a Jack Russell that only drank ice water out of a beer mug. And then she didn't like me when I came and visit them. I was like, get rid of that dog. No, I wasn't. I actually was. Anyway, and so it drank and ate from their cups and slept in their bed. It was like a daughter to him. And then one day, a traveler dropped in on the rich man, and he was too stingy to take an animal from his own herds, the cattle and herds and flocks, and make a meal for his visitor. So what did he do? He took the poor man's one and only lamb and prepared a meal and set it before his guest. David exploded in anger. He was in rage. He's like, as surely as God lives, he said to Nathan, the man who did this ought to be lynched. He must repay for the lamb four times for his crime and for his stinginess. He absolutely lost it, flew off the, the whatever the hook. Because it's one way to look at somebody else and go, they should not have. But he didn't realize. So Nathan goes, you are that man. You are that man. And so David sits there in the presence of Nathan the prophet and he says, this is what God says, I made you a king over Israel. I gave you, I saved you from the fist of Saul. I saved your life. I then gave you his daughter, the king's daughter and any other wife because he didn't only have one wife back in those days. Then he said, I also gave you Israel and Judah. I have given you all these things. He says, and if that wasn't enough, I would have still given you all, everything else you wanted, but you went over the one thing that you couldn't have. You went over the, after the one thing that was somebody else's. Why? This is the question he says. Why did you treat the word of God with such brazen contempt doing this great evil? When I read that, I was thinking, sheesh, I don't, I don't think, you know, you, you see it like that. We read that scripture like that. Because what we read it is adultery and murder. That's what we read when we read that scripture. Great man of God that fell. He made a decision and he fell into the trap of adultery and he fell into the trap of murder. But Nathan doesn't 
even go there. He just goes, why did you treat the word of God with such brazen contempt? He takes it back to what his responsibility was to the word of God and what God required of David and how he required him to live. He doesn't even touch on, you were an adulterer, you were a murderer. He takes it straight back to, you are not living the way God wants you to live and taking his word seriously. When did that happen? When did you take the word of God and make it just an accessory to your life? Because the thing is, David didn't sin when he stepped into, climbed into bed with Bathsheba. David's sin started when he was in a place where he shouldn't have been. Because when you start the Second Samuel chapter 11, it says, David was at home, or let me read it to you so you can hear what it says. It happened in springtime when all the kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all the fighting men off. So all the kings were at battle, but David stayed at home. He sent all the fighting men to go and fight the war, but David made himself the exception. And so the thing is, here we are finding this place going, okay, well, it's great. Yeah, David shouldn't have been where he should have been. He, there was a war. There was a very real battle that they were taking part of, and he found himself in a place of complacent. Because if he wasn't there that day, he would not have seen Bathsheba. If he was out in the front lines, he would never have had to commit adultery, have an affair, make some pregnant, kill somebody. He would have been fighting in a war. And when you read the accounts of David, when you study his life, David walked in such favor, and it says he acquired of the Lord, and the Lord gave him the answers, and they won. He acquired of the Lord, God gave him the answers, and he won. So David was already walking in victory. It wasn't even a given because he was so close to God. But the very moment he stepped back and said, okay, this is the exception for me. This is the exception. I don't, I don't feel the need to be there this time. Something got in into his heart. Something changed. And that's where it starts. That hidden thing, because nobody thought anything of it. He's the king. He could have sent his, his commanders and chiefs and armies. He could have done anything he wanted. He was the king. But it's not what God required of him. And so, coming back to the seeing God, he gets to the place where he says, Oh, Nathan, against God I've sinned. I have completely sinned. And God says to him, You've done this in secret, and I'm going to do it with the whole country. You're going to see and he goes, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't believe I did I sinned against God and immediately starts repenting. And Nathan says, yes, but that's not the last word. Yes, you have sinned. It's not the last word. And yes, there is going to be a consequence. But God forgives you. He forgives you. But then his first son, that son that he had out of a, an affair, gets, is, is killed seven days after, or he's, he dies. And so what happened? Where is this all going? If we want to see God, we need to have pure hearts. And if we want to have pure hearts, we're going to have to stay in line with what the Word of God says to us. And so what happens is we, you know, especially me, this is very hard for me to stand and and communicate because this is not my personality, to stand here and and go down this route. I I like to encourage. It's my my, um, my gifting, I suppose. It's my motivational gifting. I like to tell you it's going to be great and God is good all the time and He is and that when you apply yourself, you will see things in God's eye and He's going to answer your prayers because that's just in me. That's, that's very easy. But when God's going, okay, Charlene, well, if you want to see it, are you willing to pay the price to see it? What does a pure heart mean? And in the, in the Greek, the pure heart or the word for the heart means kadira or cardia, you know, Cardia, who's Greek here? Anyone? Not? Have you not read The Advantage? You would love The Advantage. You would change your whole business. Anyway, and so I'm just thinking of you guys who are in, in that sort of job. But anyway, so cardia means, it actually means to apply to the physical heart. It refers to our thoughts, our desires, our sense of purpose. What is your purpose attached to? What are you chasing after? What are you looking for? Our sense of purpose comes back to our heart. Our will, our understanding, and our character. That's what our heart is. And God goes, you need to keep all those things pure. All of those things pure. And so the words that I don't even want to say because they are teachings on their own, but as a church, let us be a church where we find no guile in us, no competitiveness, no judgments, no critic, no pride. You know, pride is, when you were studying this word like, 
all the Bible scholars, like C.S. Lewis and Stott and all of them, they, they all get to the same con- like conversation point where they say pride actually is the foundation of all evil. Because when pride enters your heart, it's from pride that we compete and, and you know, murder and gossip and this and that. And they all go, it's the foundation. Because pride was the very thing that made the devil the devil. Because he thought he could do it his own way. He thought that he could rise up and go, okay, well, you know, I will rise up. It's the same sin that entered in the Garden of Eden where he said, Eve, if you just tasted of this, God's telling fibs. He's not real. Like, surely you know more than that. Pride. Let me just take you off. And so pride are all these things that are, are these things in our hearts? Let it not be in our hearts because if we're going to keep it pure, we need to have a singleness of heart towards God. No hypocrisy, no guile, no hidden motives. And the thing is, these things are secret. So it's so easy to judge somebody who has been caught in adultery, been accused of murder, has had a tax fraud thing, has, you know, done this, that, and the next thing. And because those things are outward things. But where did it start? In their hearts. So what are our thoughts, our intentions? What are our purposes? Because if we as a church, we sang that song this morning, Spirit, come. Spirit, come. Pour out on us here and now. Be full this house. Spirit, come. And we want to see it. God goes... If you're pure in heart, you're going to see it. That's the promise. If you are pure in heart, you're going to see it. And so in Isaiah 43, it says, forget about what's happened. Forget about that. Forget about what's gone on in your life. Forget about what has taken place or been done to you. Forget about everything that you've, everything up until this point, because I'm doing a new thing. Now, What does that mean to forget about those things? It doesn't mean to say it never happened. Some of you are sitting in this room and you are carrying very deep emotional hurts, burdens, whatever you want to call it, because you've gone through a tough time. You've had to walk through very real battles and fights. And by by God going, forget about those things, he's not saying, I don't care about that. He's saying, forget about them. It's over. He, it's not going to change, but you can either live under that till this point and not live under it for longer. Does that make sense? Forget about that. I, while I was preparing, I was, I was, I was worshipping and, and stuff, and I just saw this picture of, do you know, especially in the cartoons, Tom and Jerry cartoons and Butch. Is Butch the, um, what do you call it, the dog, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? And how there's, he's always on a, on a leash and a chain, and he can go a certain distance, and so Tom and Jerry would tease him, and he will chase after them. And in his mind, there's a, per, there's a perception of freedom, there's a perception of movement, because in actual fact, he's got so much room to run away and run around in, and he can walk, and he can, he's got his kennel, and he can go to his water bowl, and he can go to the shade and the tree, and you know, he can chase some butterflies or do whatever you need to do. You've seen dogs on, on chains. But it gets to the point when he starts chasing after the very thing that he needs to take hold of and he reaches the point and he stops. And I felt that there's some of those things happening in our church over us as as believers where we're chasing after the things of God. We're going, how come I get to this point and I just can't get further? How come I get to this point and I can't get further? Because in real life I'm moving around and God's blessing me. I can see freedom in certain things. But there's there's a limit to what you're experiencing. And I felt God say, Charlene, get rid of, get rid of. Because it's a perception of freedom, but it's not a freedom. It's, it's a perception of you've got places, you, you, you can move and, and have your way, but it's not. And in Hebrews 12, it says, strip off, strip off every unnecessary weight and sin, which so easily and cleverly entangles us. God's not even saying, how, how dumb can you be? He says, it's so easy. It's so easy to walk around with these things that are in our heart, these secret things in our heart, and we don't even know that they are causing a limitation to us stepping into the next thing, breaking free from that thing. And God's going, get rid of it. Get rid of it. If we're at a church, and I mean, can you see what God has done? I'm looking at Lindsay and Doug. They've been here for a year. Miracle meeting. Actually, everyone that's sitting here is actually a very miracle meeting. Do you know? Like, how did you end up here? How did you land right here? You know, if you were to think about God, how I landed. Lindsay and Doug turned around at a color conference, and she's sitting behind me, 
12, 15 years ago, Lindsay was a lecturer at a Bible college I went to. No, it actually wasn't at Bible college. It was a course she was running. And I was like, I know you. I know you. James and Corinthia. James, Corinthia has a friend who was sitting on a bus with somebody else in the middle of London, speaks about this church. Here they are. Carrie Ann and Garth, you guys saw it on Facebook. Just a Facebook ran, because that happens very sporadically. We don't do it a lot. She saw it, and then months, a few months, weeks later, you decided, let's just pop in. Think about it. Kelly and Darren, they were at a, at a Bible study, not a Bible study, at a nursery school. Spoken to them once, had Bailey, and, and then Kelly, Kelly came to visit me, and she said, tell me about your church. And I was like, oh, and I was newly the pastor, and so I still sometimes you know, don't tell people I'm a pastor, I just sort of like, oh, I work at a church. And so she was like, tell me about your church. And I was like, oh, it's just a small church and it's very nice and it's new and all the rest. And she left. And in my heart, I knew I'd missed an opportunity because I didn't invite her. And then I was like devastated. And those of you who were at prayer meeting that week, I was like, I met this girl. She asked me about our church. She wanted to know and I didn't invite her. I missed the opportunity. Pray for another opportunity. Had a baby. Kelly came, she went, tell me again about your church. So I told her about my church, and I told her she should come. Look at what God's done. Look, Julia I met because we both had the baby at the same time, and she couldn't drive, but I started driving before her because she was obeying the law of the land, and <laughs> we had Caesars, and she wanted to buy, drive her new RAV4, and I was like, just get in it, can you jump, you know, Caesars, you can't drive for six weeks or whatever. Just come. Next minute, look, here they are. Right here. Johnny and Lizzie, they were only going to come and help for a few minutes, months. David and Siggy were here and said, don't be scared to make this your home. They didn't even know. They were like, we're not making this our home. We're going back to South Africa. Four years later, because God knew that Denver and I would step into this, and we couldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Johnny and Lizzie. Never underestimate Johnny and Lizzie. You guys got to pray for them. You got to cook for them, go and clean for them, because without them, this would not happen, as with everybody else. But they step into our lives and make it easier. And then we've got Megan, who's attached to this, and the teachers over there, and the school people. And we've got, we've inherited Sunshine Ladies. Liz comes and she brings all the Sunshine Ladies before she even knew that she was going to join this church. Think about, well, Jolyn, you've just been here from day one. Jolyn was here before us, actually. You were. You were in the, the December um, mission team that came over. Oh, yeah. It counts. Church started in the November. We were on honeymoon, and uh, we weren't, we, did we know yet we were coming? We weren't going to come. We were never going to come to this church plant, just so that you know that. This is just a bit of history, because we're family, right? No, wait, I have to tell you about Roger and Micah in a second, okay? Because that is also phenomenal. So we weren't going to come. The church was planting a church. We weren't going to come, and then we were planning our wedding, and something else like, well, maybe, you know, we, we actually want to pray for this church plant. We actually want to be part of the, the praying into it. And Adele, one of the pastors at the time, said, sure, you can come and pray. And three weeks in, we went, Denver dropped me off at home, and I was like, do you think we're going to end up? And he goes, yeah, we're going. So we're like, we'll come for two years. My mom thinks I can't count at all. We've been here 12 years. <laughs> right? So we're still here. We've had babies. We've bought a house. And it's like, that doesn't look easy. Your roots are going deeper and deeper. Let me tell you about Micah and, and Roger. So Lizzie put something on Facebook or a, a thing, whatever, to sell a uh, table and chairs. Correct me if I'm wrong. Somebody comes in, fetches the tables and chairs. Lizzie invites everyone to church. Everyone. Dog walkers, postmen, the ice cream truck driver. She'll run out, not to buy ice cream, but to ask them to come to church. And the next minute, who was it? Haley. She came that last time with you guys. Hey, she's been here once. So Haley comes and she comes to, to collect, you know, because... I love SW20 Moms and Facebook and Gumtree. You know, you know I love that. She comes in, Lizzie invites them, Micah and Roger, who are the sister and the brother, right? Brother-in-law. Uh, sister-in-law, sister-in-law. Micah's sister-in-law, cousin. How's that? <laughs> We're talking about you, Micah. And here they are today. It's not by chance that you find yourself here. I have no idea why I told you all of that, but it was good anyway, hey? <laughs> which so easily entangles you. And Myra, let me tell you about Myra. So Myra and Bronwyn, Bronwyn, I landed in Bethlehem, um, in Durban, got out the back of the bucky, it's just like a truck, and went, stepped into Bible college and knew nobody. I came from a small town, four hours away, stepped into a city, went to Bible college, and Bronwyn was the Bible college secretary. I ended up living with her, and then I moved here 
And then 12 years later, she moves here. Haven't seen her, haven't heard from her, because she, she left working at the Bible College and went and worked at lots of different places in Unilever and stuff. And here they are today. I used to have roast dinners at Myra's house. She makes amazing crispy potatoes. Not Auntie Bessie's, Auntie Myra's. And it's amazing. So, it will come back to me. It will tie in, I promise. Every unnecessary weight and sin which so easily entangles and cleverly entangles, let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract and focusing our eyes on Jesus. Then in verse 14 it says, Make every effort to live at peace with each other, to be holy. Is that purity? It once again comes, he goes, make every effort to be holy because without holiness we will not see God. No one will see God. It comes back to saying, God, do this. Pour out your spirit. Do what you need to do because without it we're not going to see you. We're going to see, that's right, that's where it came from. Have you seen what God has done in this church? Just by taking account of how you even got here. God is so faithful, he just reminded me what we were saying. How you, what he, have you seen it? Because this is just the beginning, and if we're going to take hold of it, we're going, to, we're going to have to make sure there's holiness. Because in Isaiah 43, it says, Be alert and be present, because I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. That is not gra- grammatically, it's a, you can't see it yet, right, because it's still like in the process of being developed. And It's there it is. Meaning, where is it? There is it. You can see it. We can see it. We can experience it. We can take hold of it already. The Bible's already saying it. Can you see it? Be present. Be alert. Because there it is. So if it's there and we are here, we are not where it is. Sure. If it's there and we are here and we are not saying, God, move me from I've heard about it and I can see it. Move me into it. Because it's not a promise of a tease of you can't take hold of it. It's a promise of it's here right now. Here and now. I've been listening to um, podcasts and somebody that you guys know, um, Stephen Furtick, which we've, we've listened to, and he's, he's, what God's doing in their church is phenomenal. But do you realize what God's doing in people's churches are phenomenal because they've made themselves available? It's not because he's just the chosen few and we sort of can go, okay, the big churches we know and, oh, well, if God, you know this, and they just, they've all got the same hairstyle and they all wear the same shoes and that's not what it's about. Let us never have those words that come out of our mouths because then we think that it's all about people and we've totally taken God out of the equation. We have never got to the point where we cannot learn from somebody else. We will never be at the place where we can do it better than somebody else. We can be grateful for what God has graced us with, but please, as a church, we're not going to be a church that goes, well, they just jump on one leg. Because what is going on in their hearts Because by us saying that just exposes what's going on in our heart. Maybe it's time for us to actually start working on the things in our own lives that we can think we can judge in other people's lives. It's time for us to stop saying, well, they are just, whatever that is that you think you have the right to judge in somebody else's house, have you started working that in your own life? We are going to be a church that celebrates what God's doing. So there you go, Stephen Furtick, 10 years old, what God has done. They have got multiple campuses He's an incredible communicator and preacher, and he's got a revelation, and he's just passionate. Now, he might not be your style, but it's not about your style. It's about the Word of God. They've just done a 10-night revival. Ten nights. Last night, I I was saying to Denver, they're now on night, night, night nine, and today they've got three more, and they finished today. They started last week, Wednesday. For those of you who have gone to conference, you do four days, three days, and you're exhausted. Ten nights. They've had different speakers. But the worship team has been the same every single night, pouring their hearts into, leading the charge, gathering the people. It starts right there when you turn your eyes up, and they have been worshiping their hearts out. God is moving. And the thing is that that I've picked up, because I haven't been able to watch all of them, obviously not, but the thing is, it's not about it's coming. God has already come. Jesus has already come. He's already given us his spirit. It's already done. And so when we speak about revival, we sort of go, oh, send it this way, God. Send it. We're waiting. We're waiting. Do you know you can sit in the back line of surf and miss every single wave that comes past you? 
Do you know that it's possible that just because you're sitting where the good waves are at, you're not actually going to catch a wave? Is am I right or wrong? It can land on you, which is jolly scary, especially in Durban, where there's lots of sharks. And if you're in Cape Town, you might just, you know, freeze to death because it's so cold. But either way, you can sit going, I'm ready, God, just come, just come, just come. And he's going, okay, come, let's do this together. We can't just wait. We've got to be ready. We've got to prepare. We've got to get rid of anything that entangles us. So I was doing a school run this week and, and singing that song, just that fullness, spirit come, spirit come. And I'm walking and there's something in me sort of going, okay, God, you know, Hussein Bolt kicks in. I want to chase after it saying, God, I didn't run down the street like that. I had Bailey and the pram. See, I can tell you all the excuses why I couldn't. But in my heart, I was going, God, I want it. I want it for us. I want it for me. I want it for the church that we actually start going, I'm chasing after that God, that revival, that Holy Spirit pouring out. Because when that happens, we step into a whole new level of understanding what Jesus did for us. It says, um, sorry, I don't even know where all my notes are. I want to read it out of a, the right, out of the message. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore within me a sense of being brand new. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just have the sense of being brand new? That sense of it's all clear and gone. Your debt's been wiped away. We've had testimony in this last week how God's just canceled debt. That burden just goes like that. When you actually release the thing that you've been carrying because of your fundamental attribution error, You've blamed somebody else, but you've wanted to be treated differently. It's their fault for hurting you, but you have not actually gone, I've never hurt anybody. And so the same way that we want God to respond to us, we need to respond to other people. Let's not fall trap to, to that human error. <coughs> do not throw me far away from your presence and do not remove your Holy Spirit with me. Give, me, give back to me the deep delight of being saved by you. Isn't that a cry of your heart? God, let me get that deep delight. That deep delight. Because God, when you pour out your spirit, when I've made room for you, when you've cleared it out, when you have cut me free from that, that chokehold chain that gives me a, a false sense of freedom because this is happening, I want to break out of that. I want to take hold of the next thing. I want to see it in my family. I want to see it in my businesses. I want to see it in my relationships. I want to see it in my relationship with you, God. Come, Lord Jesus, come and take that all away. Because blessed are the pure in heart. Our intentions, our thoughts, our motivations, because we will see God. And so today, if you're here and you're and you've never actually said, "Okay, God, I'll take responsibility for me. I'll take responsibility for the way of my intentions and my my um, my thoughts and and deep things that that have sort of bound you and you feel and you felt that chokehold. You felt that I'm chasing after something, but I I get to a certain point and then you get you get pulled back or you get stopped. I want to pray for us today. Because if we're going to step into the there it is, we're going to have to let go of the things that keep us back. So while everyone's head is closed, uh, um, bowed and everyone's eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to be brave enough and sort of go, okay, how would, what has been done to me that I have, I have used as an excuse for my behavior? What has happened in life where I have taken it on as just a burden? What have I ha used to, to sort of just cloud that personal, private space? It's not about exposing you right now because God knows exactly what's going on in your heart. And he says to David, what you did in secret, what's happening in secret in your heart, he goes, it's going to become public. The Bible speaks about what the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and so today, if there's some business you need to take care of between you and God, Take this moment. Take this moment and say, God, I've, I've used this as an excuse and I've blamed people when I should have taken responsibility. If there's something in your heart where you sort of go, God, is there anything stopping me from seeing your goodness in my life? Take that moment right now and physically see it, picture it. Take on the Jesus came and he died for you on the cross. 
He washed away all your sins. He set you on high. He made a place for you at his table. He's provided all your needs. He has, he has gone before you and he makes paths straight. He takes mountains and brings them low. He gave his life for you. He gave you his everything. And the Bible says, if I've already given you my son, how much more along with him will I not give you every other thing? See, most of us might understand that we are forgiven and saved by grace, which is true. But if grace only forgives our sins, why does Hebrews 12 say that we need to be holy? Because without holiness, we will not see God. It warns us to be diligent so that we do not fall short of it. We have to recognize God's grace isn't just for forgiveness, but it is actually for the empowerment to live as he has called us to. And that changes grace. That changes everything. Grace gives us the ability to go beyond our natural ability. God says his grace is sufficient for you. So Father, I thank you that while we are here in this space, God, this is just between me and you, you and God. You don't need to expose yourself, but you do need to expose it before him because he knows. And may today be the day where you say, God, I want to see it. I don't want to live in a there it is. I want to, spe- I want to live in a here it is. Pour it out, your spirit. Let revival start in me, Jesus. And so, God, I pray right now, Lord, where people are having a moment between you and them, Lord God, that you would minister to them, you would speak to them, God, that you would, you would show them the things that only you can. And, God, I pray that today that we would not live in a space where we can easily give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, yet not let other people off the hook. But, Father, we would treat people the way you've treated us and the way we want to be treated. And so, Father God, I thank you that no longer those chains that have held us back those little foxes that have got in our thoughts, our hurts, our burdens that we've carried. God, I thank you that today they are broken in Jesus' name. God, your word says that anyone that calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. And so right now, just call out on him. Speak to him and say to him, Jesus, cut me free. Bring healing. I release it. Release it. Give it to him. Those things that have just worn you down and you don't even know it, but you know you've reached a limit every now and then. Just hand it right over. And so, Father, I pray over all these people today, God, and I pray that you would bless them, that you would go before them, that you would promote them endlessly, Father God, that you would give them wisdom and courage and favor. Father God, I thank you that wherever they set their foot to do, Father, you have already given to them, and whatever they put their hand to do, Father, you have, you will bless. And God, I pray health. I pray wisdom. I pray promotion. I pray enlargement. I pray purity in their hearts, God. I pray for wide open spaces, God. I pray that revival will start in us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.